The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to the February 2019 Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Journal Club Podcast. The Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum is dedicated to the promotion, education, and dissemination of pre-hospital research. We believe that it is the responsibility of emergency medical professionals worldwide to build a body of evidence to examine pre-hospital emergency care. Here with the PCRF Journal Club, we take a closer look at some of the latest research happening in EMS. I'm Megan Corey, and I'm joined today by David Page, Dr. Tony Fernandez, and Dr. Bill Toon. We've got a full house today, and today we'll be reviewing the article entitled, Is Use of Warning Lights and Sirens Associated with Increased Risk of Ambulance Crashes? Contemporary Analysis Using the National EMS Information System, or NEMSIS, data, published in Annals of Emergency Medicine. Now, as usual, this review is paired with an article written by Dr. Tony Fernandez, and this is in EMS World, and it's called The Journal Watch. Uh, you can, we encourage listeners to check out this article at emsworld.com under the category of education and training. And thank you all for joining us today. Let's begin, and we want to remind listeners that you can use the chat feature on your screen to type in questions and comments, and we'll bring those into the conversation as we go. Now, the use of lights and sirens in many ways is a defining feature of what we do in EMS. I mean, in theory, the use of lights and sirens should allow for a faster response to the scene of a life-threatening emergency and to transport a critical patient to life-saving specialty patient care that can't be provided in the field. Previous research on safety of lights and sirens use has been inconclusive and limited single system analyses, but there are a few things that we do know from research. Uh, one is that the injury rates and fatalities are more likely reported when lights and sirens are used. And another is restraint devices reduce injury and fatalities when used by ambulance occupants, regardless of whether lights and sirens are used. So, but it's unclear whether lights and sirens specifically increase the risk of crashing. So the purpose of this study was to provide a nationwide comparison of reported crash rates in the United States and this was for transport ambulance responding to and transporting from the scene of a 911 emergency uh, with and without lights and sirens. So we've got a nice full house uh, today, and we've got some people with some experience with us too. Uh, let me bring in uh, Dr. Tony Fernandez, who can help us understand um, this study and, and really the use of the NEMSIS data, which we've talked about before. Tony? Awesome. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, yeah, this is a great study. And they looked at, uh, they used NEMSIS data. And like uh, Megan was saying earlier, we have talked about NEMSIS before, but just as a brief refresher, EMS is very uh, lucky in that we are one of the only healthcare uh, organizations or public safety organizations that have a national standardized data set. And that's called NEMSIS. Um, it is funded by uh, NHTSA. And essentially what NEMSIS does is they collect data uh, from almost every state and territory in the United States. Um, these data come into NEMSIS. They're usually, when you, when you record your PCRs locally, typically you don't record them in, in the NEMSIS standard. Um, you'll record them in based on whatever third-party software vendor you're using, um, whether that's ESO or EMS charts or, or uh, uh, a whole host of other ones. Um, there's that, that, that data that you collect locally is mapped to the NEMSIS standard. Um, and NEMSIS has a data dictionary, um, and you can, you can understand how everything is mapped locally. And one of the greatest things about NEMSIS is um, they make their data available to not just researchers, but um, to the general public. So you can go onto the NEMSIS website and they have a data cube where if you have interesting questions um, that aren't necessarily for research, but um, maybe for local QI comparisons or uh, for um, any other purpose, you can go on and use their data cube uh, to, to see how elements stack up against each other and run some cross tabs. Uh, or you can request a, a research data set. Um, and that it based on that needs to be approved by Nemsis. You send in a request for them. Um, but there is there last I checked, there was no charge. If there is a charge that I'm, I'm, I'm it's going to be very minimal. Um, and they have a new research data set that they publish every year um, with all of the Nemsis available elements. And there are 
hundreds of, of available Nemesis elements um, on the version two and the version three standard. Um, and this, uh, this they used for this study, they used the 2016 uh, Nemesis public release research data set. Um, what's interesting about that is they also got permission from Nemesis um, to use agency level data that isn't usually um, published, uh, made available, um, but and that's they, they specifically said that it was uh, strictly for some analyses and they didn't report that um, analysis. But um, it's a it's a well it's a very uh, it's a robust data set and everyone on the call should be familiar with it. Um, it's Nemesis, and uh, you can just Google search Nemesis. You don't even, and not to be mistaken for Nemesis, um, but in all their, their website, yeah, it's it that that happens very often. And um, yes. Google will actually, if you're ch typing on your phone, it might automatically correct you uh, to Nemesis. But um, they are a friend, uh, and they um, they have some great data. And you can see on the screen now, these are the elements that they use. So these, the E, the e codes, um, those are specific to Nemesis. Um, and they section out what, what part of Nemesis um, each of these data sets are in, or each of these data elements are in. And they tell you uh, right here all the data elements that they use. So you can see some were for inclusion into the study. Um, they have their outcome measures right here, um, which is the type of delay and the um, response delay or transport delay. And then they have some exposure elements that they use, uh, response mode to scene, transport mode to scene, and the like. Um, so what they wanted to know, as uh, Megan was describing earlier, was this transport mode, um, it, it, does that have an association with, with crashes? Now, as with any data set, there are some limitations. Um, and that, that is true with Nemesis. Uh, um, in the version two data, um, and specifically, Nemesis doesn't have a, a an element that said what did did a crash occur? Um, what time did the crash occur? How long how how long of a delay did that re, um, did that relate to in in terms of the call? Um, but the way that they got around that was they used the type of delay. Um, and one of the types of delays that can be reported in Nemesis is a delay resulting from a crash, um, a vehicle crash either either in response or during the transport phase of the call. So they use that as their outcome measure, and they looked at whether lights and sirens were um, were utilized on those calls. And lights and sirens in Nemesis is also an interesting variable, um, where they have uh, you and this is also on the screen. It's um, um, E02 underscore 20 response mode to scene and then response or transport mode from scene. They're, they're similar elements. The responses are the same. So you have overall lights and sirens. So that will tell you if lights and sirens are used for the entire call. And then the next two, you have initial lights and sirens, which was downgraded to no lights and sirens or no lights and sirens that were upgraded. Um, and then you have uh, no lights and sirens. So those are. They, they have lights and sirens reported on their on their um, table here twice, um, but it, as you can see with the code, it should it's the same element that that's probably um, uh, an editing error. Um, but so th those are the elements, and they did something real interesting with lights and sirens. So they looked at total lights and sirens. So that was anyone that had lights and sirens for the entire response for the entire transport. They categorized any of these downgrades or upgrades into an any lights and sirens category. Um, and then they had a, a no lights and sirens category. So they took these uh, four categories and they, they, they whittled them down to the three to do the analysis. Um, they had some interesting exclusions. So you can see here the exclusion criteria. So they just wanted to look at ground ambulances. So anything that was identified as a fixed wing or a rotary wing, uh, so airplanes or helicopters, they were excluded. Um, they also excluded uh, if they didn't have any lights and sirens data, they were excluded from the preliminary analysis. Um, we'll talk about them later because they put them back in for some sensitivity analyses. Um, and that's just to uh, verify or validate their results. Um, they also they also excluded folks if they were 
or calls, excuse me, if they were into facility transports, intercepts, medical transports, standbys, um, response, responses by non-transport or rescue vehicles, mutual aid activations, supervisor responses, um, those were all excluded from the analysis. So they really wanted to get to ground transport 911 um, calls or emergency calls. Um, and you can see they, they, they looked at some covariates um, for the multivariable adjustment. They looked at time of day, which they categorize as daytime, evening, or overnight. Uh, they looked at whether what, what the community size, so was it urban, suburban, rural, or wilderness? Um, they looked at service level, so was it EMT, intermediate, or paramedic? Uh, and they, if the level was nurse or a physician or other, uh, they collapsed those all into the paramedic category. They also looked at organization type, um, and you can see there's government, fire, hospital, private, non-hospital, and community nonprofit or tribal. Um, and then finally, they looked at the pay status. So were they volunteer, were they non-volunteer, or were they mixed? Um, and they ran, they, they, they combined all these together um, to, to see what impacts, what has an association with crashes um, in for, for EMS. So Tony, let me ask you a quick question here. So um, when you're designing a research study based on this question and you have your predictors, you have your exposure of, of you know, response to the scene, lights and sirens versus not lights and sirens, you have your outcome measure, whether there's a vehicle crash or, uh, or the type of transport delay that resulted in a vehicle crash. Um, and then you start thinking, okay, what kind of things could affect the outcome measure, your confounding variables, and you want to control for those. And then you look at, okay, these are the other things they're going to measure. But why would things, why would they care about such kind of level of service and organization type and organization status? Does that have to do with like EVOC training or, I mean, wh why would why would that matter? Yeah, so the idea um, when you're running a logistic regression model is you want to um, you want to see what your independent variable of interest is and how that relates to your outcome variable of interest. In this case, the outcome variable of interest is the is the vehicle crash. The independent variable of of interest is your response mode, whether that was lights and sirens or not. But you don't want to look at that um, with blinders on, so to speak because there are other things that can have some impact on that on that relationship. Now, in, with any research, there are things that you won't be able to capture, so to speak. Um, so there are there are agency specific differences, such as the things you mentioned, like EVOC training um, that may not be included in the data set. So as a proxy for a lot of these things, you'll want to capture other demographic variables that may um, may be able to adjust the relationship accordingly um, when you when you don't have the actual variable. So the, the reason why they use um, uh, organization type is there may be unrecorded differences in how organization types, the organizations, uh, different types of organizations, excuse me, respond. Um, so for instance, and just for sake of argument here, um, it may be less likely for um, for private ambulance companies to respond uh, lights and sirens, um, but they always transport lights and sirens, or and and fire base could be the opposite. Now again, I'm making that up just for the sake of just to, for this example here, but there are things that you can't always tease out. So you want to you want to make your best estimate with the data you have available. How are you going to adjust for things that? Um, that you wouldn't get in the in the crude analysis of response mode and crash. Okay, thank you. And and uh, Dave and Tony, I don't know if you guys have anything to add. We we like to try and teach a little bit of research in here too. And I think that was uh, Tony just summarized it well. Another thing that might have popped to mind is you know things that you can't control for. And the, and the authors mentioned that things like road conditions, hazard conditions, weather. Um, I'm, I'm just curious if they were thought of doing, you know, looking at regions and time of year and things like that, but uh, maybe that wasn't the question really. So um, Dave or Tony, do you have anything to add to this before we go into results? Uh, I would um, say, 
Sorry, okay. please go ahead, Dave. I'm sorry. No, go, go yeah, ahead, or, go ahead, or Bill Toon. Sorry, Bill Toon was also in, in here. Um, I was just. This is Tony, and I was just going to say that um, it's there. There are they were limited um, by the Nemesis version two data set. It is not as robust as version three. Um, so, for instance, you can't in and and this is true today, even in version three, you can't actually say. I want to look. I want to compare this state, this state to that state. Um, you can. They do allow you to cut off uh, regions of the United States but for an analysis like this. That's less useful. Um, so I think, as a proxy for all that, they use their urban, suburban, rural, or wilderness status. Um, I agree that road conditions would be fantastic, um, but that's just not currently um, an element that Nemesis collects. Okay. Um uh, let me uh, forward it to the first or to the next uh, slide, if I can get control of these slides there, uh, which actually does break out what, what they found in terms of agency characteristics, run characteristics, and lights and sirens use. Um, so what what is this one telling us? So this is table I'll, two. So this is, this is uh, this is telling you the percent of lights and sirens for uh, use for response and for transport time. So you'll see, um, we'll start on the left-hand side so that you'll see these are the, cat cat these are the characteristics um, and how they categorized each of them. So they took, for instance, response volume was, it was really interesting the way that they did this. So essentially what they did was they lined up response volumes uh, in for simplicity's sake, let's say they did this in, in a spreadsheet, um, and they organized them from smallest to largest. And then they just they allowed the data to determine where the cut points were. So they wanted five uh, relatively equally sized categories. And as you can see in the runs, comma, N um, column, these categories are, are, are similar in the quintiles uh, for response volume. Um, so essentially what this is saying is uh, anyone who had uh, responses from 3,861 to 12,070, um, those folks are, for this analysis, are quote unquote the same. Um, and we're going to compare those folks who are the same to these other categories. Um, and this is a nice way to do it when you don't have a good way um, or, or subject matter expertise that, or any other citations that say this, this is how response volume should be separated, a lot of folks will just let the data do the, do the work there. Um, they did the same for lights and sirens use uh, down there. Uh, it's about the fourth um, section of this table. Uh, and then they just said the, the response, and then if you go all the way to the right, I'll tell you the percent of lights and sirens use. You can see in almost all of these categories, um, I believe actually in all of them, lights and sirens are used more often in the response phase of yeah. the EMF event than the transport phase. And I think that's the take home. Anything surprise you about this table? I mean, the, the, I think the time of day sort of surprised me a little bit, um, but the, 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 you know, kind of uniformity across the percentage of lights and sirens used in response and transport uh, by time of day. Um, any Anything look um, kind of surprising to you in terms of differences? Um, you know, I, I didn't, it, it, I guess it's kind of, it's, if you look at the table, you'll see, if you look in wilderness, uh, they have a slightly lower percentage of, of lights and sirens for the response. And that, uh -huh. that kind of makes sense, right? Because if you're in a wilderness atmosphere uh, environment, you probably um, are in heavy <laughs> traffic. Um, so you, you probably don't need to listen to the, the, the wailing the entire time you're, for your, your 30 minute or however it long, it's long it takes to respond to the call. Um, and you see something similar with um, uh, the tribal organizations, the community, nonprofit, or tribal. They're slightly less. Um, I don't have a good uh, a, a good guess on why that might be, but overall, I think this pretty much is is what I would have expected to see. Yeah. Okay. Um, Bill Toon, um, do you have any uh, 
comments about the um, kind of the conversation that we're having about the way to measure this and you know one of so we did have a comment from one of a question that was posted about whether or not you know they looked at crashes that were caused by lights and sirens and uh, not necessarily the the vehicles themselves involved in it uh, meaning the ambulances involved and the the authors do bring that up you know the in the limitations and in the questions at the end or the discussion at the end they talk about these quote weak accidents um you know knowing that this you know this could be an underestimate of between the the way the data were collected and the lack of having uh, these wake accidents, they could be an underestimate of the safety issues of of uh, using lights and sirens. So, what I'll do is I'll jump in here and and just say I'm I'm impressed with what the authors did, you know, because this is one of the biggest uh, reports on the topic area. So that makes it, of course, very interesting and rich. The challenge is, is the database is not really designed to analyze the accident itself. And we're totally dependent upon the accuracy of self-reporting. For example, some of the agencies I worked for that had one of these software things, they often told us to ignore all that information and it was set to default. So we don't know the accuracy of, is, and I would say it's underreported. So mm -hmm. I think that why they've pulled this together and they've been able to come up with this ratio of the number of accidents per thousand hundred thousand miles i believe it is it what we really don't know is, is is how big it is you know what the true magnitude of it is and the other interesting part would be is, is a totally separate area where crashes ambulance crashes were investigated just as rigorously as an airplane accident would be you know you know, it's we have a. Um, I think it's interesting too. Um, um, I'm going to jump in here. Go ahead. Megan. I, Go ahead. Uh, you know, lights and siren are, are no different than any other treatment that we do, right? If we think of it as an intervention, um, uh, people are afraid uh, to respond without lights and siren because they're afraid to be sued. Uh, there's also the whole, you know, sexy and ooh la la nature of we're going to get there as soon as we can. And, but people expect that. In fact, the metrics that you, we have used to, to say that people were doing things right or wrong or, or that they were doing that high performing EMS systems had low response times, that was a measure of how well you did. And in fact, as a paramedic, one of my measures, one of my direct reports, sit down and do a, a yearly analysis of my, my data with, with my manager is how quickly do you get to the scene and uh, and no one's going to want to report. Oh well, we knew that that was just uh, going to be canceled, so we kind of dragged our feet and didn't hit the in route button or didn't actually say on the radio we were in route, etc. And I, so it's a very complicated thing to measure with a database that wasn't intended for that. And that's part of the the difficulty is this this concept that has a causal effect. Um, and so, you know, I, I would want us to, and I, I'm, I'm, it's too bad that they didn't do this because I think Lawrence Brown would have uh, agreed with us. Had he been able to be on this podcast, he would have, I think, jumped at the chance to, to say that if, if lights and siren were a therapy, then what's the number to treat needed to treat? You know, what, what's the number needed to harm? How many of these do we do before somebody gets hurt? And, and for some things, it's, you know, very low and others very high. Yeah, I think I think you bring up a couple of good points. And actually, Creighton, um, hello, Creighton, we love you guys. You are always on our uh, the podcast with us, and you always provide some great input. And they they posted um, a comment about the NHTSA's 2017 report um, entitled uh, "Lights and Sirens Used by EMS Above All Do No Harm," um, assuming that they they have similar conclusions. But they like uh, also that uh, the study mentions. That managing public expectations, and I think Dave, you're getting at that. I can't imagine rolling through. First of all, sitting in traffic um, in San Francisco. That's where I am. So I can imagine sitting in traffic and and not trying to at least get through. The other thing would be I can't imagine rolling up on the scene of a shooting and not having your lights and sirens, <laughs> or, or having at least lights rolling up and feeling like what would the public think, you know, uh, of us driving through, you know, code two to everything. Or we call it, you know, by traveling codes, no lights and sirens. Let's say. Um, to a 911 response, so th there is that public expectation, and and yeah, a, a lot of consideration there. 
I think that the the work that Doug Koopas did with with that NHTSA report is phenomenal, and and anyone who hasn't had a chance to look at that 2017 um, uh, uh, PDF is it's available on EMS.gov, and and really really begins to do a deep dive on <clears throat> exactly what is time saved and what's the risk. Yes. And um, when you look at previous research, I was around in '98 when Jeff Ho. Um, and Brian Casey, were, were, uh, they did this follow the ambulance one. I, I liked it because it was prospective. Um, it was randomized. They, they simply followed ambulances in a regular vehicle to see how long it would take them to get to the same scene uh, from either in, in, Minneapolis, in Minneapolis, they did it in, in downtown environments or suburban environments. And I, I think it was a very well done prospective study. Uh, <clears throat> so that's back in 1998, I can't believe it's been that long, and saved three minutes, whereas there's been others, you know, in 94, they saved 3.6 minutes. Who knows with today's traffic if, in fact, um, we have further savings or fewer savings, but it is, um, you know, it's interesting that at least in, in this group, in this particular study, uh, they're, they're, they're saying that more of these occurred in the transport phase, which is really interesting to yes, me. Yes, that is um, very interesting. Because that's when you have the patient in the back. That's, that's when right. things should be actually, uh, there should be less risk taking and um, the time saved is maybe arguably less um, uh, if in fact you're driving more cautiously and uh, it, it, it really begs the question, is the risk worth it? And I, I do like how they address the, you know, what about the STEMI, the cardiac arrest? But uh-huh. I think Akupas does a, a really good job of outlining exactly for some of these things that we think, where we think three minutes may be the difference, perhaps notifying the cath lab and saving 20 minutes and taking the three extra minutes without lights and siren is, is worth it. Um, so it's it's about time management, not necessarily how much time we would save in in the ambulance. Uh, I think there's there's it's it's more complex and it might be disease specific. So you know in in certain conditions there are some things that only a, a, a surgeon can fix, uh, but in other circumstances we just rush to get to an ER and then sit and wait for five, 10 minutes for the right team to be properly assembled and for the right equipment to arrive. It's about the system, you know? Yeah, that's true. Um, so let's uh, let's talk about this, the results from this study in particular, and then we can wrap that back around too as to what, what to do next, because I know uh, Creighton posted it, and you're kind of alluding to it, that mixed methods research um, and some maybe some adding some qualitative uh, and some input from the field and other things, rather uh, rather than just relying on uh, l- large quantitative sets. Let's get back to this large quantitative set, um, Tony. This is the this is where the rubber meets the road, right? Table three. Uh, this is the yeah. crash related delays. Three, yeah. Um, yeah, table three is an important one. So um, this is you can see they did. Um, this is where we talked about before where they stratified they collapsed lights and sirens into no lights and sirens any lights and sirens and full lights and sirens and they came up with a rate per hundred thousand <clears throat> and um, they also can't they also gave us some odds ratios um, for anyone who who's on the call just a quick refresher of odds ratios uh, your kind of line in the sand is one for odds ratios if your odds ratio is above one that means your outcome is, for simplicity's sake, is more likely to happen. Um, it actually means that the odds of that outcome are increased, um, but they, they, while they are not exactly the same thing, let's call them the same thing for the time being. Um, so if it's above one, your your outcome is more likely to, ha- you're more likely to see that outcome. If it's less than one, you're less likely to see that outcome. Um, in most in most medical scientific literature, an outcome of two uh, is is pretty impressive. And then you also want to look at your 95% confidence intervals, and these are all the way to the right of this table, and you'll see them in parentheses here. Um, if one is somewhere in between 
your lower bounds and your upper bounds of your 95% confidence interval. So if your entire confidence interval is above one, that's a statistically significant result. If your entire confidence intervals are below one, those are statistically significant results. If somehow they cross one, for, ex for example, if your confidence interval is uh, 0.7 to 1.3, um, one would be in between that confidence interval and those results would not be statistically significant. So if you're looking at this, if you look at, so let's just start with the response phase for no lights and sirens. You'll see the rate was uh, 4.6 per 100,000 uh, 911 responses. Um, and they use that as their reference category. So essentially what that means is everyone else, the any lights and sirens and the full lights and sirens are being compared to the no lights and sirens group. That's why you have one as you're lying in the sand here and there's no confidence intervals there. When you look at any lights and sirens, so again, this is including lights and sirens, it's including um, initial lights and sirens downgraded to no lights and sirens or initially no lights and sirens upgraded to lights and sirens. You'll see that the odds ratio is above one, means that you're more likely uh, to, see, to see a crash um, with any lights and sirens. Your rate per 100,000 was 5.4 and you'll see you have your odds ratios and your adjusted odds ratios. I failed to mention that. So your, your odds ratio, your OR, this is just your crude odds ratio. This is essentially looking at it with blinders on. So as if the only thing in the world that mattered to an ambulance crash was lights and sirens. Um, that's what your, your odds ratio is. Your AOR, which is an adjusted odds ratio, is when you're running a model that also includes other important elements. Um, that could either that modify or adjust that that relationship. Um, so as you can see, um, some of those odds ratios changed uh, from slightly and in some cases dramatically when you adjusted for other important um, other important. So, so it's almost it's, like um, if it's 2.9 here for any use of lights and sirens, 2.8. That that's almost three times more likely that the ambulance is going to crash, correct, yeah. uh, Tony? Yep. Yeah. So, it, so we're, we, that's a, that's a huge odds ratio. Am, am I right? Yeah. Those are, those are, those are very impressive odds ratios. And, um, you, you can, it, to, to tease this out in your mind for the folks who are looking at this, if you're, if the odds ratios are, are kind of, uh, getting a little too far in the weeds, you definitely look back at this rate per 100,000 because that'll help put that into context for you a little bit. The rate per 100,000 with no lights and sirens in the transport phase was seven, whereas any lights and sirens was 17 um, and full lights and sirens was was close to 17. Um, so you'll see that 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 um, can help you understand the jump in the odds ratios here. I think these two, the table three and then the next figure, are great teaching tools for research as well when you're teaching odds ratios and and just how to read um, data rates per 100,000. So this one, uh, like you just said, and then the next one, um, uh, this here is your visualization of the adjusted yeah. odds ratios, just getting to what you were talking about. Yeah, I love these tables. Um, we're starting to see these more um, in, in research papers. and. Uh, just uh, this, this looks complicated, but it's really it's it's not as daunting as it seems. You can see in the middle of this table right here, you'll see the one, and there's a gray line all the way up to one. And I called that the line in the sand before. Um, your boxes, your squares in the middle, those are your odds ratios along that scale from one to ten, and from one to point one on the bottom. And then these lines that go through that box, those are your those are your confidence intervals. You can see in with almost every uh, element or in this independent variable that they looked at, and with almost every category, you'll see that the box is over one, meaning that the adjusted odds ratio is is increased, and your more your more your odds are, your odds of seeing a crash are increased, or you're more likely to see a crash. And, um, and for people who can't see that screen, just just so, so we can give them a play by play. Uh, yeah. We're talking about uh, how they analyze whether it was day, evening, overnight, whether it's urban, suburban, rural. Uh, these were all significant, right? These are they're particularly in urban. You get reached 3.1 adjusted odds ratios, 2.9 in suburban. 
But even the 2.5 in rural, they were in all environments, these resulted in crashes. And for those people who say, well, it's because of a you know fire versus government versus private ambulance, all services were more likely uh, to, to reach crashes. And um, it is impressively high for private uh, versus uh, you know the 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 other groups. So uh, volunteer versus non-volunteer, everyone was likely or more likely to crash. Uh, and and um, you know if if you if you think of uh, that's mostly during the transports. Now uh, in the response phase, I do love how uh, Dr. Kupas in the NHTSA report called this the Clausen the way Clausen described maximal, maximal response disease. This is the concept of sending the cavalry um, when anybody calls. And so you have m many more lights and siren responses, police, fire, and EMS to a, a, an incident than we have this transport phase. So technically, if, we sh if this was all about lights and sirens, we should see a dramatic increase in the response uh, rate because more vehicles would would be crashing in the response phase. Now we don't know uh, if these are you know how many of them are actually transport vehicles or not. If if uh, we haven't been able to tease that out, but we do know if they occur during a transport that that there should be less of them because there's less uh, numerically there's just less of that. And uh, in this case, it just looks like it doesn't matter where you look, it's significant. Do you agree there, Tony? I do. Um, there are, if you look at the overall categories for sure, there are some, um, just to emphasize uh, the point, there are some categories, uh, response categories within um, each of these elements that are not significant. Um, it, so, for instance, if you're looking at transport, uh, the will, uh, for, for the urban categories, urban, rural, suburban, and wilderness, wilderness right here, you can see that while the odds ratio is above one, the confidence interval here crosses one. It's 0.5 to 2.8. So one is in that 95% confidence interval. So that that category is not is no different. Um, however, the rest of them are um, are significantly different. Um, so that's just a just a quick point on how to read these graphs. But yeah, you can you can certainly see that uh, every every element um, seems to favor no lights and sirens. Uh, we have a couple of comments that are made in our uh, comment screen here. Uh, one is from Bruce Evans that when a unit's upgraded with a patient in it and the vehicle, that should be a sentinel event and draw immediate attention to field supervision. So uh, sort of an immediate uh, training action. I um, love that comment. If, if I can jump yeah. on that, because yeah. um, Bruce is an author for a crew resource management text and um, has been a, a key part in NAMT safety course. Uh, and, and I do I do think that this is uh, an opportunity for interventional research because we don't practice good CRM and culture of safety. And if we did practice a sterile cockpit, as, as Doug Kupas mentioned, this is on page 34 of the NHTSA report, the, these, these culture of safety expectations with mission-specific communication uh, limiting uh, uh, the chit chat, limiting the the uh, radio blasting, you know, uh, Van Halen while you're driving down. I probably just dated myself. Um, uh, uh, Carly B uh, on the on the on the on the roadway that we have to improve the way we think of these responses, and uh, we have very very distracted driving going on with communications pagers, uh, you know. Uh, additional messages coming in through CAD. And this this comment of, of Bruce's is, is so key. Uh, for those that don't know what a Sentinel event is in a hospital, uh, they, they usually code these as sort of go back, review what just happened uh, in order for that to happen, in order for that to have occurred. And if a patient's condition changed so dramatically that we have to uh, kick up lights and siren, then either you know what? Why did we not identify that sooner, or uh, could there have been something done so that it wouldn't have been a lights and siren transport? Was that really truly needed? Uh, a bit like who do we intubate? Do we in, should we have intubated this person or not? 
Yeah. And a, a comment from Stephen Mountford, who I'm assuming is an aeromedical provider, says the same reason we don't tell pilots about the acuity of the patient. So that's suggesting that there might be some degree of, uh, you know, being amped when you're uh, transporting a critical patient. Uh, Creighton also points out, which is, uh, you know, something I think that they really point out in this, uh, in the discussion part of this um, study or the limitations, and that is they really don't know about things like whether there were multiple vehicles responding, whether the ambulance, the, the transport vehicle was the second one in a string of escort, you know, vehicles or, you know, whether there were co-responders, which uh, could could also be associated with an increase in, you know, wake effect accidents. Uh, let's see here. We also had a comment that I thought was really an interesting one, and that was um, Charles Miller had, had really reframed the question too, which I think maybe, uh, you know, this is a study about the um, the uh, risk of lights and sirens, but what about the benefits? Has anybody, you know, looked reframed the question and looked at, you know, benefits of lights and sirens transport? So that's that's actually, you know, how do we measure the benefit? Well, uh, and, and I think that that Koopas did a, a pretty good job of saying, well, you know, if the therapy, if the lights and siren therapy is is about um, reducing time, three minutes is the, uh, you know, one to three minutes is what, what ta people have been able to document that it does save. If it's, if it's a, a human factor uh, uh, or, or a feeling of security and safety that when, when, when I call, you know, I can hear them coming, that's immeasurable, right? That's a feeling of, I live in a culture, a, a, a place where if I need help, you know, people will be here right away. And so sometimes we're willing to put up with risk as long as we know uh, we have this this feeling of safety. Uh, maybe maybe you could compare this to police officers carrying guns. I, I think I'll quickly deteriorate into politics and get in trouble. But if if in fact, um, <laughs> you know, the police having a, a gun strapped to their hip is 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 a huge deterrent makes people feel like hey you know if somebody else has a gun they'll have a gun and they can actually do something about it but um if you really go back and think well how many incidents you know did, did were there where they actually used the gun and and was there a need for the gun maybe maybe not and how many times did they have their gun and it, it got used and it got used incorrectly so that's kind of i i think part of this whole concept of this is a uh, lights and siren is not without risk, but you know what? What does it give you instead? I, I hope Clay Mann is is uh, able to unmute and, and give us his perspective as uh, not only a thought leader but also intimately familiar with this database. You know, this has been a great conversation. You know, I think the Nemesis uh, data set is a good good model for answering questions like this simply because it can represent such a large swath of EMS uh, care across the country. The points that have been made are, are just really, really good. I, I, um, the, only, the only thing I just might add here is um, there's also been some great work that has been done to determine you know, whether or not response time and then transport time really does make a difference. There, the great uh, publication that just came out in JAMA actually uh, last week looking at um, over 2,000 counties in the in the United States looking at whether or not the outcome of severe crashes increased with longer response time. So they were able to link Nemesis data with FARS, the fatal, uh, fatal accident crash reporting system, and, and determined what the increase is by, uh, by additional minute of elapsed response time. So these, these type of studies, I think um, what's coming out with Nemesis, uh, with the strength of the data set, with the fact that it isn't a probabilistic sample, that it's truly trying to be a full census, it allows us to weight the these risks. And so, and so yeah, this is a great conversation. What What is the, uh, risk compared to the value for a severe crash um, of going lights and sirens. I'm I'm truly heartened by this research, and I'm I really feel like we'll we'll soon have some metrics that really uh, draw some firm um, parameters around these types of questions. Thank you. Those are great points. Um, we also 
uh, have a couple of other tables to show here too, uh, kind of extrapolating on what, what uh, Tony was um, discussing before, which were um, the specific odds um, ratios or the association between uh, lights and sirens use and um, that's stratified by agency response volume. So earlier we saw this stratification, Tony, that you had described by response volume and lights and sirens use and uh, you can see the same I mean, it seems like they're just kind of slicing and dicing as many ways as possible uh, and still coming up with this same um, result. Yeah, and I think that um, just for anyone listening, one of the reasons why they had to do this stratification, and as you'll see as you get into data analyses, um, the bigger your data set is, the more likely you are to find statistical significance um, just by chance alone. Uh, that's not necessarily a, a true relationship. Um, and this is a huge data set. So to account for that, um, rather than just throw everything in a model and, and find that, that everything is significant, which you pretty much know going in because the data set's so large, um, they sliced and diced it a little bit, or scientific terms, they stratified their data, um, and they ran their, they ran their similar analyses. So you can see um, essentially stratified means looking just at that category um, to see to see where where the numbers lie. And then we also had a sensitivity um, analysis for association between lights and sirens and ambulance crashes. Can you uh, walk us through this? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as they talked about earlier, they 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 initially excluded folks with missing lights and sirens data. Um, and uh, that was probably the right choice because you don't, you, you really can't tell for sure um, where the, what those folks, uh, if they were lights and sirens or if they were downgraded or upgraded or what. Um, so initially they excluded it, but just to just to see how test the the accuracy of their analyses, um, they did a couple sensitivity analyses here. And the first one, as you'll see, the first row, they took all those missing data. Um, the the calls with missing data, and they assumed that those folks had did not have lights and sirens, or did not use lights and sirens in the response or the transport. And as you can see, that didn't by by adding them into the model, that didn't really change your results um, too dramatically. They did the same by excluding really small call volumes, um, which they they deemed as less than a thousand. So any agency who had less than a thousand calls. Um, for the year, they excluded those, and you can see again that didn't substantially change um, the the measures of effect. Uh, and then last, they, then they did two other ones. They excluded one agency who apparently had uh, a disproportionate. Uh, they had just a whole lot of transport crashes, um, more than anyone else. So they excluded that agency to see if that would change their results. As you can see, it didn't. Um, and they did the same. I skipped the row here. I apologize. Um, they excluded low volumes. They also excluded high volumes. So anyone over 200,000, uh, any agencies over 200,000 calls, they excluded those. And they ran the same analysis to see how their measures of effect changed. And you can see here, they didn't really change. So this is kind of um, a check on their results, just to make sure that by their inclusion exclusion criteria, they weren't missing anything. Great. And then, uh, you know, this next one, the, the final table that's in the paper might get a little bit at what was mentioned before, uh, which was the um, mutual aid responses. I'm sure that's a specific category. Was that, is that a NEMSIS category that's, that's um, selected or yeah. is this, yeah. Yep. So you, um, there are, uh, there are a different and Clay you can help me probably help me here there are different uh, types of calls that you can have um, one is a 911 response to scene um, some are standbys and one of them is mutual aid and they initially um, excluded mutual aid responses um, but they they did look at those specifically to see if there was any difference um, and uh, you can see the the results right here Okay, I think um, the main issue here, and, and the one that stands out the most, is that the, it, this is this persistent effect of more uh, incidents during the transport phase, uh, which means we're patients, you know, the patients that we're going to help, you know, might be actually put at risk. Uh, 
So something was commented on earlier too about uh, culture. I think it was um, the Creighton that might have posted something about you know, this kind of EMS culture of, of lights and sirens use. And, and I, I would say a lot of that is kind of spurred on by the media and, and, and expectations of the public and, and all of those things. Absolutely. I, I, you know, I think there is an element that we, we have to acknowledge that is just about, you know, public safety and, and um, we're the insurance blanket on everybody saying, you know what, if it all goes south and you've been eating too much McDonald's for, you know, 50 years, then when you hit the panic button, we're going to go, we're going to go take care of it. Um, but I don't want to minimize the the, the time savings here in response, uh, because it might be different in transport than it is in response, right? So once care has been established and we're gonna, you know, maybe save three minutes uh, getting somebody to a cath lab, if the cath lab is spun up and ready to go, that may make a difference, but you know, less of a difference. Whereas it might make a huge difference if we have someone who arrives with an AED uh, quickly and uh, shock somebody and and recognizing that and being able to get through traffic uh, or asking permission for people to move over, whether they do or not, that's a whole other question, uh, that, um, that might actually be a time savings. When you look at gridlock in cities, um, you know, you wouldn't want to try and attempt to go around uh, and go on the shoulder, uh, you know, if you didn't have some sort of warning signal that said, we're just not going to sit in traffic for, for 30, 40, 50 minutes uh, to try and get through a, a, a gridlocked uh, environment. So perhaps the infrastructure, our own cultural acknowledgement of the, of the, of the traffic patterns and, and the difficulty is a problem, but um, there's recent, I, I think it was a, um, a news report that uh, some of the ambulances in, oh, I'm forgetting where, uh, they'll jam the radio signal for the people in the in the car so that they they uh, can no longer hear their their loud music and they have to have to pull over or or at least acknowledge that there's an emergency vehicle nearby. Mm -hmm. And if we systematize some of that, who knows what we can achieve in in combinations of either drone response to reduce uh, uh, time to get a particular device to the scene or advice to the scene, video advice, but, uh, but also just engineering traffic and um, uh, light patterns so that we can uh, move traffic away so that, you know, the response vehicles can get through and, and less of a kind of a each individual person approaches it the way they're going to do it. Yeah, um, Max Severide would like to know uh, if Dr. Mann or someone could, uh, Tony, maybe if it could ask um, or to, could discuss how a state might be able to identify these sentinel crashes through Nemesis. Um, is that through the, the cubes you were talking about? Um, actually uh, get more information to help the, link those cases with crash-related data outside Nemesis. Yeah, this is quite, I'll take that question. It's a great question. Um, um, just a little bit of history, just um, one quick minute. Um, for us to get all states and territories to buy into this idea of collecting data on the NEMSIS standard among all EMS agencies, sending the data to the state and then sending a subset of data to the national level, we entered into a data use agreement with them that really had to tailor to the least common denominator so that we kind of had a common um, uh, contract for all of our states and territories. And that contract was pretty conservative. It doesn't allow us to free up any type of a geographic measure at all in the, in the NEMSIS data set, including which states submitted the data, right? So we can't even tell you which records come from North Carolina. Uh, Tony was talking about this, for example. We um, at the national level, we can't do that. But what we can do, we collect we collect those geo measures here, and we can use the HIPAA de-identification clause to build masked elements for investigators that um, deal with a specific hypothesis, and then just kind of send that new masked element to them so they can attach it to the data that they already have. So, for example, the study that appears in JAMA this um, uh, past week. Uh, the investigator just 
indicated to us which which uh, zip codes of interest they were interested in. So we have all this far data, all these fatal accidents uh, that occurred across the country. Here's here's the zip codes where those accidents occurred. And then we provided them with the response time for traffic crashes for all of those zip codes. And so it's it's not a one-to-one -one match between the FARS data and the NEMSIS data, but it's EMS specific. So it's a bit, it's a bit, um, uh, um, removed from a one-to-one -one match, but we can do that type of a thing with any kind of a hypothesis that a person may have. Does that answer the question? I think that's helpful. You know, I think uh, when we think of kind of the next steps, and I like the the message that Creighton said. So what? Uh, I love it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Leggio <laughs> should be on this panel because. Uh, he he has a lot to contribute. So uh, so so what? I think we have to get better at the, at doing better research. So um, you know you describe a, a much more uh, specific way of of identifying where the problems are, and uh, using the data that we are collecting. Because uh, uh, many of us write an EMS chart and we think, oh, who cares? Nobody's ever going to read this. Nobody ever, you know, it doesn't matter. But in fact, there's many things that matter about it, and, and it's it's part of our little grain of sand that we we put into the to make the collective uh, you know improvement of a system. So uh, so you know kudos to Nemsis for being so open to working with researchers, and hopefully people listening to this podcast because there's some uh, very high performing folks can think of the Nemsis data set and say how could we use it. Uh, but I think there's more to learn here than just uh, let's do more research. I mean, initially, uh, immediately, we have to start thinking, is this patient really, should this patient be transported lights and siren? So uh, for students at, at Creighton and UCLA and uh, every else that's, that's listening in today, uh, please be thinking, maybe this is a patient that does not need lights and siren and Knowing that there's a, a tremendous increase, a threefold increase in in odds that uh, you're going to crash, then it's time to say uh, what what does what is required, and uh, for us not to not to be obsessed with it, but practice that culture of safety, and hopefully through the dispatch system identify responses that don't require lights and siren. Because I'm sorry, but I'm still going on a lot of calls where. Uh, somebody had a fever for a week, and now now it's panic time because otherwise if they, they have to wait for an hour, it's shift change, and they oh, they just don't want to do that. So well, it's both a request and a transport issue. Don't you think there's also a lot of, I mean, there's several comments that are coming in too about, um, you know, maybe we're living in the dark ages still, th still thinking lights and sirens. We have the preemption devices. This is, you know, we've got a lot of technology out there that maybe just hasn't been, uh, invented yet or used yet or applied yet and so consequently what do we have now we have studies that are coming out that are saying well is uber better is you know we've, we've got all these different things kind of questioning the system so maybe it's time to rethink the system what, what would it take clay here's a message from les barda uh, about what would it take to alter the database to be able to include uh, uh, the preempt information whether or not they're using lights that are opticom or whatever other brand to to uh switch the lights because the nemesis data set is pretty set you don't just add stuff at willy-nilly yeah yeah great question and actually um uh tony's comments speak a little bit to that version three of nemesis which is now active includes those preemptive devices so you can um, um, not only indicate whether you're going lights and sirens, but you can also indicate what other uh, uh, processes, are, uh, processes are in place are you using to either get to the scene or get to the hospital. Interesting. It's such an interesting metric. If I were to do a study on that, I, I'd be afraid that, you know, half the lights uh, don't have it. It's only on major roadways in some cases. It's not everywhere. But I'm glad uh, as far as the at Les's question is concerned, that if if they if people are using a new set that they're actually they have it, uh, so that's great. Great. So um, you know, we it is 
almost the top of the hour here, so I'm wondering if anyone has any other comments. We've actually had Dr. Bill Toon on here and haven't heard from him. You've been awfully quiet out there. We just shut you down there, Bill, or do you have any comments to make? You always <laughs> shut me down. Also, I have my barky dogs, as usual, playing in the background because it's time for their walk. You know, compared to when I started 43 years ago riding on an ambulance, it is wonderful to see data. That they had ambulances back there? I thought there was, like, <laughs> horses and carriages. Sorry. Oh, You'll, you'll, you'll pay for that later. <laughs> um, Join us next month. <laughs> that's right. I think the key thing here is, is that we're we're going from knowing truly nothing to knowing something. And as we're beginning to open that faucet, we want to certainly know much more than we know now. And I think that this is certainly a start, but Dave touched on it already. If we have something here that says there are more accidents choosing lights and sirens, agencies right now can do everything within their power to limit or minimize the use of lights and siren. And I still think the greatest first responder has been untapped. And I think that what we do need to do is build our systems that truly include the public as part of our response system, whether it be the use of AEDs, stopping bleeding, or just not moving anyone and putting a blanket over them and letting 911 get there and just comfort them. I still think that that would allow us to modify the kinds of response we need to the scene. So in closing, I thank the authors. It's really great to see this, and I need to yeah. go find that JAMA article and read that now. Yeah, that sounds yeah, like great. a good one. And I know our um, organizers also posted the uh, link to the NHTSA reference earlier and also the um, EMS Culture of Safety text uh, that was referenced earlier, and that was Bruce Evans. Um, any other final words, uh, Dave or Tony? Uh, just be safe out there. It's a dangerous job. We really, yes. really have to change our, our our way of thinking about it and keep collecting the data because otherwise we can't do the meaningful research that's being done. And thank you, Clay, uh, for, for the work that you do and uh, making sure that that happens at a big, big scale. Yes, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. I see Jaime Flores also joined us. Uh, welcome, and, and thank you all for joining us. Um, this month, uh, remember to join us later this month for the Education Research Podcast on Friday, February 22nd, 10 a.m. Pacific, noon Central, where we will be talking about best practices for teaching pharmacology to undergraduate nursing students, a systematic review of the literature. But also remember, next month, same day, it's Monday, second Monday, it'll be Monday, March 11th, 10 a.m. Pacific, noon Central, we'll be talking about another article, clinical or operational in nature. So we will see you next time. Thank you.